Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. We just wanted to give a few moments to give folks the chance to, to sign on and join us. Um, I wanna welcome you to this information session on the master's program in human rights at the Catholic University of America. Uh, the, the master's program is offered through the IHE, the Institute for Human Ecology. So let me just tell you a little bit about the IHE. Uh, the IHE at the Catholic University is the nation's leading academic institute committed to increasing scientific understanding of the economic, cultural, and social conditions that are vital for human flourishing. And the IHE draws on the Catholic intellectual tradition and its mission is to educate students. So it, it also sponsors research, it advises church leaders, uh, its scholars serve as voices in the public square, and it also organizes conferences and lectures uh, and sponsors the master's program. So the master's program itself was started in 2019, and it's designed for students who want to study human rights from a distinctively Catholic perspective. And it draws upon existing courses of several schools at the Catholic University of America. And we'll talk about uh, in more detail about uh, how exciting an opportunity that is, but it culminates in an interdisciplinary degree that's awarded by the School of Arts and Sciences. So I'm joined tonight to help, help, uh, help us learn more about the program by its director, uh, Bill Saunders, uh, who is an attorney. And in addition to directing this program, he's a religious liberty and human rights scholar at Catholic University. He's a fellow at the IHE, and he's the co-director for the Center for Religious Liberty at the Catholic University uh, Columbus School of Law. He is also a past president of the Fellowship for Catholic Scholars. And before joining CUA, he served as senior vice president and senior counsel at Americans United for Life. And before that, I hope I'm not aging you too much here, Bill, but before that, he was a senior fellow in bioethics and human rights counsel at the Family Research Council. Uh, he attended the University of North Carolina and received his law degree from Harvard. Uh, and, and we're going to learn more about his story and, and what brought him to be the director uh, of this program. Uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Kirk. Uh, I'm also a lawyer. I teach law, uh, especially in the area of the family at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. I also direct a center called Center, the Center for Law and the Human Person. And my center has a very complementary mission uh, to the IHE and this master's program, but in the specific field of law. And I'm also uh, pleased to be a colleague of Bill's uh, as a faculty fellow at the IHE. So thank you for joining us, Bill. I'm really happy to be here tonight to interview you uh, about the program. Before, before I jump in though, I do wanna uh, give a couple of uh, housekeeping notes here. Um, first of all, please feel free to, to uh, type any questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will see those. Uh, and you know, a little more than halfway into the program, um, we will draw upon those. We wanna turn it over to you to be responsive to your questions. Uh, and also this uh, presentation is being recorded and the video will be available on our website, uh, which is mahumanrights.com uh, following the presentation. So with that, I thought we could open, Bill, I gave a brief bio of your uh, accomplishments, but I wondered if you could maybe just talk a little bit more um, about your experience and what prompted you to become so passionate about human rights. First, thank you, Elizabeth, for doing this. I mean, it's really, uh, it's great for Catholic University that you're there. It's great to work with you. Um, and, and we collaborate on a lot of things. And it's an exciting thing for potential students who listen to this or watch it subsequently. You're one of the people at Catholic University who they have an opportunity to get to know and to work with. And I have students of mine now that are doing some uh, involved in some of your work at the law school. So uh, the first thing I actually want to say before I talk about myself is just say Catholic University is a spectacular place to be. If you're interested in the Catholic intellectual uh, tradition, or you might call it the Western intellectual tradition, if you're interested in Catholic social teaching, 
Um, there are a tremendous number of people, and many of them are fellows of IAG or associated fellows in one way or another. Um, so the way I got so interested in this was, uh, I think many students or many people listening to this could be at crossroads of their life or they could be at a point of uncertainty and they don't know what to do next. Um, and I was at that point where I was already a lawyer, but I, I didn't really know what to do. I, I had been doing a lot of business law and I didn't want to do it. And uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And just friends suggested I go to work with a human rights organization, which I did. And that, there's a lot of things that was happening in my own life. And so everybody's life is different. And I'm sure the people, whoever listens, it'll be different. But at that point in my life, um, um, I was also um, kind of, I was on the road to becoming a Catholic, although I wasn't one right at that time. But I was very interested in religion. And at the human rights organization, whenever a, a religion-based kind of human rights issue came in, it often came to me. And uh, through that, I met a bishop from a, a forgotten part of the world, the Sudan, uh, which is, I mean, obviously, uh, many people know where that is, but it's a very remote, forgotten place in Africa. And uh, through that bishop, I worked very hard on trying to help the folks there and um, uh, became committed to the, to, to the we, we were helping people who were getting murdered. Uh, and we were also helping people who were getting enslaved, uh, trying to help them to, avoid, you know, get free from slavery and try to help the people from not getting killed. And so I kind of saw up front, um, you know, the importance and dignity of each human person, even if they were a forgotten person in a forgotten part of the world. And I think that that, along with my becoming Catholic with a couple of year, within a couple of years, is what put me on the path I, I'm still on. Yeah, and, and how, can you say more about how that path led you to founding a master's program in, in human rights? Like what's, what's, what's so important about studying human rights? Yeah, the, uh, the thing about the IHE, the Institute for Human Ecology, is it also, you know, it, it, it um, leans heavily on, the, on uh, Catholic social teaching, which is reflection by the popes and others other Catholic intellectuals like Thomas Aquinas on the uh, all kinds of issues that face that face us as human beings. So uh, what I, what I found as I lived my life forward from that point was that I, I tell my students this. So if you're going to be one of my students, if you when you listen to this, get ready because I'll tell it to you again. But you can't. Most people can't. I could not see my life in prospect. I can only see it in I can only see it in retrospect. So put me where I am now and I can explain how it happened. And I think the what's really going on is you're trying to listen to the Holy Spirit who will respond to you if you try to listen. And so anyway, I found as I was living my life forward from that Sudan point, uh, I was doing things that um, uh, some people wouldn't even think are human rights. Like I was working on issues of the family. I was working on issues of religious freedom. I was working on issues of bioethics and uh, other life issues, uh, both end of life issues and beginning of life issues. And it all made sense and all came together when you understand the kind of church's teaching on the dignity of the human person and also the important the church's teaching on religion and also the church's teaching on the family and other issues I actually have a couple of things this is a, just a booklet i have of kind of human rights treaties and elizabeth and i are both lawyers and if you know this is this is different treaties and if you look at these treaties and i look and i i had 
studied this in law school, you see actually a secular kind of reflection of the church's teaching. So I was seeing the kind of things, um, for instance, I just turned without even intending to, to a covenant on civil and political rights, Article 23, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. That could have, that is directly parallel to what the Catholic Church teaches. So as I was going forward, I'd become a Catholic. Uh, I was shaped by, to some extent, by my legal education. Uh, I was in kind of human rights field, and I was working on these issues, and they all just flowed consistently with Catholic social teaching. So as I got older and older, um, I, I wanted to share that. Um, I wanted to help people draw it together because one of the biggest problems we have in the world is that false human rights are proclaimed and that discourages people for understanding and fighting for true human rights. And I wanted people to understand that there is a unity to all these rights that makes sense. I mean, it was this, it's basically the same thing the world agreed to after World War II. And I wanted people to understand that if you believe in, in, in these kind of things that right out of World War II, um, and you're a Catholic, you don't have anything to be ashamed about. Uh, in fact, I would say that the church has the deepest thinking on why you have these things in these treaties. So anyways, all that came together, I realized that I really, and, and also the biggest influence in my life is John Paul II, Pope John Paul II. And um, he was the Pope when I came in. I think he's one of the greatest popes there's ever been. And he confronted communism and some of the, maybe most, maybe all the folks listening may not realize, but communism was, uh, when he confronted it, it seemed like it was uh, going to win, and it was going to last, at least last 100 years, and instead of that, John Paul II confronted it. You know, he, he insisted on the dignity of each person, and he, insist, he, insist, he insisted on the, the importance of religious liberty, and religious freedom, and the right to practice your faith. And that brought down Poland's uh, communist government, and that brought down, along with some other people, but critically importantly, it helped bring down the Berlin Wall and end communism. So anyway, John Paul II was a big influence on me, and really what we do in this program is, uh, I, I hope, continue his mission, which was to engage human rights with the Catholic understanding. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And I think I, I take it to be, I mean, that's what's unique about this master's program as distinguished from others around the country uh, is this distinct emphasis and, and really not just emphasis, but like the whole program flows forth from the Catholic understanding of the human person his relationship to the world, to one another. Yeah. In Is fact, what say? yeah, yeah, no, exactly right. Um, as far as I know, there is no other, certainly no other program in the United States. There may be another kind of traditionally Catholic country somewhere, but as far as I know, there's no other program exactly like this. Certainly there's not one in the United States. I mean, if you, if you participate in this program, you'll, you'll learn about these, these laws and these treaties and these declarations. So you'll understand the kind of secular human rights basis, which I think is fantastic and strong and it's providential that we have it. And it came out of the horror of World War II, this determination to respect human rights. And then that'll all be, you'll understand it deeper and better through courses in theology, philosophy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you'll be equipped to really understand human rights from the Catholic perspective. Yeah, so maybe 
um, shifting a bit, you mentioned theology and philosophy. Could you describe more the curriculum of the program and what students would study uh, if they attend it? Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, Elizabeth is uh, one of the people you'd work with if you come to to my program, the Catholic University, and there are other fantastic people, and they are uh, teach some of these classes. So it's interdisciplinary, and that means in particular theology, philosophy, political theory, law, um, and it's taught by some of the most renowned people in their fields um, who are also usually, not always, fellows of the IHE. So, um, you know, you'll study uh, Aquinas and other natural law thinkers. You'll study um, various theologians um, and other theorists. Um, so you'll get you'll get the chance to go in depth and, and then you'll have some more practical courses. So it's not, it's, it's intellectual content, but it's with, it has practical aspects uh, attached to it. Like we have, sorry, uh, we can talk more about them or not, but we have some practical things like uh, Ambassador Sam Brownback, who was the U.S. Uh, ambassador for International Religious Freedom. He teaches a, a practical course for our students. Um, the former deputy, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, uh, Robert Destro, teaches some for us. Um, I have a lot of practical experiences. I mean, one of the things I did back in the Sudan work was I set up my own NGO and for I don't know five six years I had really two full-time jobs uh, which I don't recommend to anybody to have to do because it about killed me but we we were trying to you know do what we're doing in Sudan and and in fact you see on the wall back here there's this this poster is um we did all kinds of things. We made a film with some folks in Hollywood who got interested in the issue. Uh, we record, and we, so we made a film. This is the film, The Hidden Gift, War and Faith in Sudan. And then we did archival interviews with former slaves and people who witnessed uh, various atrocities. Um, so anyway, I have a lot of experience with that. I want, I want the students to understand what it's like to you know, if you get if you get seized by an issue, if the Holy Spirit kind of reaches out and, and grabs you and says, this is what I want you to do, uh, you might have to set up your own NGO. Uh, human rights is not a cookie cutter career or you have to kind of go where the spirit leads you. So we, anyway, we have lots of practical experience for for the students as well. But just to kind of be very concrete, um, the program is, how long is the program? Well, the program is designed to be, so, so people listening, I'm a lawyer, and again, Elizabeth's a lawyer, so we give complicated answers. So I'm going to give a complicated answer, which is the program is designed to be a one-year program, which means you can come in in the fall, you take five courses in the fall, five courses in the spring, then you have your, your Master of Arts in Human Rights. There's also a part-time option. So if you're here, but there's not an online option. Mm -hmm. So you have to come to Washington, D.C. to study. If you are here and listening to this and you want to continue a job while you add a master's, uh, that's possible. I see. And so are there like core courses and electives or can you kind of shape the, the way you want uh, to? Yeah, it's... it's um, there's a there's a little bit of malleability in it, but essentially, essentially there are. I set a curriculum, and all the students take it, because part of the cohort idea is you take these classes with the other incoming students. 
And that's a great benefit to you because you get to know these other people and you help each other and you get known by the professors for being the master of arts and human rights uh, cohort. And my students are really, really welcomed in, in whatever classes they take in the university because they're very gifted uh, and hardworking people. So um, usually there's five courses that are required each semester. Now there's a little bit of flexibility uh, really on the 10th course. About nine courses will be required because the 10th course is usually an internship for credit. Uh, but depending on your circumstances, that could be waived and you might uh, do an elective. Uh, plus in the, uh, the course with Ambassador Brownback is not, not three credits. So you get to choose between one or two, two credit electives. So you kind of get, you might get half a elective or you might get an elective and a half. Um, but generally speaking, nine courses will be set and then you'll get to make a decision on one other. That's pretty important because I've been talking to the students the last couple of days, uh, the last couple of weeks about their internship. Um, and why is that important? Because number one, you're going to learn about an organization and you learn both about what they do, but about how they do it. And two, you, you learn from the people there how they did what they did. How did they get there? I mean, I can tell you my story. Elizabeth can tell you her story, but you, what's your story? And um, also, you'll hear about no matter what issue you're working on, you'll hear about other issues or related issues. So you find an elective in an area you're interested in. You work for that organization. Uh, and you then through it may hear, you may be at a meeting with other people, other interns, and somebody else mentions an issue you'd never thought about. Like, let's, let's just say human trafficking. Let's say you're at a, uh, a meeting on human trafficking and somebody comes in and talks about bioethical uh, aspects of human trafficking. You may have never thought about that, but there may be an organization that does it. And then that may click in your mind with the, you know, or the Holy Spirit may click it in your mind, what this is for you. So um, the internships are important. So you gain all that experience and then hopefully you have your foot in the door for an organization you're interested in working for potentially. So that's another long answer. But so the other courses though, the ones that are required, um, again, there's some uh, differentiation on the semesters, depending on whether one of our professors is on sabbatical or not, but um, there'll be a course in uh, natural law and natural rights. There'll be a course in Christian anthropology. There'll be a course in Christian uh, political theory. There'll be a course in public international law, course in human rights law, a course in international religious freedom. Um, there'll be a, there'll be a course having to do with the encyclical teaching of the popes. Um, there might be courses on uh, Christian moral life. Um, then I have a capstone course where I draw everything together in the context of Catholic social teaching. So uh, in the second semester, there's a required course with me called capstone course and I, I draw everything together um, like in the context really uh, of Catholic social teaching. So we'll look at encyclicals as well as things like, you know, we may do, Elizabeth, I think you and I, or at least I've mentioned to you, you know, we're gonna spend a, we're gonna spend a session on the Dobbs case because that's the case that overturned Roe v. Wade. That's an important, hugely important, uh, case of not just this moment, but I mean, of, of the last hundred years in the United States and its implications for um, human rights are central because the first right, as John Paul II said, was the right to life. So this is a very important case. And uh, we met today with the uh, folks at the, uh, the March for Life, which 
sometimes people listen to this, they're not here in the U.S. or they're not maybe in D.C. That That's a march that's been going on ever since Roe v. Wade for, for almost, it'll be 50 years this year. And uh, it's an incredibly successful uh, mass human rights movement where folks just refuse to accept this basic injustice. And finally, that case has been overturned. So we'll study that in the case. And I've, I have friends and colleagues like Robert George who might uh, depending on, we just have to work it out. He may teach a course on human rights. I mean, it's a class for me on human rights. So they'll be hearing from, from other kind of human rights practitioners. That's kind of an overview of the curriculum. Yeah, that, that's really great. You touched a little bit um, in that answer on, you know, the career opportunities that, you know, through the internship, um, the advantages of being in Washington um, and certainly at Catholic University with access to the various, you know, distinguished professors throughout the university. But could you speak a little bit more about the professional advantages uh, of the program? Well, you know, people listening may wonder, uh, I know a lot of people go to law school when I, when I, obviously I'm a lawyer, I went to law school. I went to law school, though, um, I'm not sure. I mean, in retrospect, again, it was the right move, but I don't think I, at the time, did it for the, the best reasons. I didn't know what I was going to do next. But some people can't afford to spend that much money to do something they're not sure they want to do. And so you get um, a superb, I think, superb uh, kind of law aspect of human rights as well as the philosophical part so if you're here in washington and for those of you who've never been in washington uh i'll just tell you that every every organization every human rights group you can think of is here in washington or has a major office here but i don't define human rights organizations in a narrow way uh, so you can take a traditional human rights organization but so let me say the Religious Freedom Institute, that's a traditional, in a sense, human rights organization that deals with the right to religious freedom. It's here in Washington. But so are most humanitarian organizations. In fact, I think everyone would have a major uh, office here. There's the Congress of the United States and all the committees that they have. My students and I met with, uh, so we call that the Hill for those of you who don't live in D.C., who work on Capitol Hill. So we met with folks from the Hill the other day so they could learn about working on the Hill and maybe uh, get their foot in the door there for doing uh, human rights work. There's also things like the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops' main offices here in Washington. I have two graduates from my program who are working there now. Um, and then let's say, you, well, you don't want to live in Washington. You want to go back to whatever state you're from or your spouse is from or something. Well, that state will have a bishop's conference and they'll probably uh, be looking for people similarly as they would here. And so if you come to DC, you get a chance to learn about human rights from all the leading organizations and you get to see it and you can see it in it, uh, legislative you can also see it in the executive branch i mean they're all the government agencies here like the department of state and places like that and all those are open to you potentially um and really it your imagine your imagination is the only limit you have of what you can look at you won't have you won't have a law degree but you'll know something about law and you'll know about many things that I, I'm quite certain that any organization would value. Well, you know, because it's an interdisciplinary program, I imagine, you know, interested candidates are, are sort of coming, you know, and, and people who attend the program sort of come from all different academic backgrounds, um, 
you know, from, from all over. Could you describe, I mean, is there an ideal candidate or, or things that you look for in, in a candidate for the program? Uh, you know, in one way there isn't, I mean, it's, it's interesting right now. I have a student from Brazil. I have a student from, uh, Chad in Africa. Uh, I have a student from Pakistan. Um, so they can be from any place in the world. They have, but the thing that there's a couple of things that are important. They have to care about human rights from the Catholic perspective. I've had non-Catholics and I've had not uh, even a non-Christian in the program, but they have to be interested in that because we are going to spend a lot of time on it and it's a waste of everybody's time. I mean, you can go to any other human rights program in the United States and learn about solely from the secular perspective. But if you want to get this kind of secular stuff as well as the Catholic stuff, you come to my program. So, you could be right out of, and I have a range, of, a range of people. I've had people who are right out of college. I've had people who've worked for a few years. Um, I've had people who are kind of taking a year off from their job to do this and then returning to that job. So they got their employer wanted them to do this, you know, and encouraged them to do it. And others who made changes. Some that go on to graduate school, some that go on to law school. So there really isn't, except that you have to be interested in human rights from the Catholic perspective. You have to understand that that really is something unique. You can't get anywhere else and you have to, to want to get it. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked a bit about you know the networking possibilities and I just want, it just occurred to me, I mean, you've had a few graduating classes now. Um, you also have an advisory board. I wonder, could you say more about your recent graduates as well as your advisory board and, and how uh, students interact with them? Yeah, I want to. Uh, yeah, the advisory board is. Um, <clears throat> I hope that anyone who listens to this will. Anybody who's serious about human rights should know about the advisory. Should know who's on the advisory board. So I said that you know the biggest influence in my life <clears throat> is John Paul II, but kind of in a, uh, a USA kind of my kind of role model in some ways. Uh, as my life has gone on, has been Mary Ann Glendon, uh, who's a great human rights law professor at Harvard. Uh, she was the first woman to head a Vatican delegation to an international conference. Um, it's a tremendous, brilliant woman, and she headed up something that we'll study in my program, which is the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. And I, we can talk more about that if, if, we, if we want to, but she was head of the commission a couple of years ago, which reflected on human rights, both from these documents I'm telling you about that came out of World War II and from the U.S. rights tradition of Consti our Constitution Declaration of Independence. Anyway, she's, she's, she's just tremendous, and she, uh, she's a big friend of our program. Then Robert George, who is... Uh, at least used to be famous, uh, very famous for every, everybody who's kind of the leading intellectual in some ways in the United States in public matters. Professor Princeton, uh, he's one on there. John Keown, who is the world's leading expert, in my opinion, on assisted suicide and things. He's at Georgetown. Tom Farr, who's president of the Religious Freedom Institute. John DiUlio, who's an uh, expert in uh, American values, who's at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Helen Alvary, who is assistant dean and professor at the George Mason Law School, and who used to be the spokesperson for the U.S. Bishops Conference. And then Father Kevin Flannery from the Gregorian University in Rome. And uh, Elizabeth is a friend of Father Kevin's, and I am too. And he just gave my human rights lecture about two weeks ago or a week ago, I guess a week ago. And um, I would just tell anybody who's listening, we'll certainly make that speech available. But with Father Kevin, you have a, an intellectual uh, reflection on human rights 
um, that is of the highest order, whereas some of the some of the lawyer approaches like mine might be a little more down in the uh, nuts and bolts kind of stuff. Of uh, but it's it's a great mix. And and last semester Kevin Flannery came through. Uh, gave a speech in Washington, and he came to talk one of my classes. Like I said, Robert George would teach one of my classes. Professor Glendon, I was talking to her, and when she comes to town, she wants to meet with my students. Uh, we went to Tom Farr's Religious Freedom Institute uh, earlier this fall and met his staff and learned about And one of my students is interning there right now. Um, so I... I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm thrilled by having this board of advisors. They're, they're people who I think are the highest renown, and they're really interested and supportive of this program, and it helps the students both to learn from them and to get opportunities because these people um, on my advisory board think highly of my program, and they're, they're very interested in helping my students. So that is a big bonus. I was just going to say, that's really incredible. I mean, I don't know what the right analogy would be, you know, the all stars or something, but I mean, it's, it's an incredible board. And so often boards of this sort are really letter on the letterhead, you know, they give credibility, their names on the website, but they don't really have much interaction. And the fact that they come to teach your class or, you know, give lectures um, and have interaction with your students is a tremendous um, opportunity, I, I would think so. Yeah, the students yeah. love it. They're, they're, they're always, they were talking to me. They're hoping that I'm going to get Professor George to teach a class next spring, which maybe we will. We, we're usually lucky, but uh, I can't promise that in advance, but we'll try. Yeah, but, um, so, and just, just a reminder for the people to put them in the Q&A box. Um, while I'm checking that, I thought, speaking of famous people, um, the the patron of the master's program, right, is uh, St. Josephine Bakita, and maybe not everybody knows about her, so I just wondered if you could uh, explain why the program is entrusted to her. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, I really am, because, um, so this is Josephine Bakita. Um, this is her prayer card, and uh, again, we're a Catholic class program uh, in my class, uh, we start off every class with a prayer uh, to her to help us. Um, she, as you can see, you know, she was uh, she was from Sudan, and she was taken as a slave uh, when she was a little girl, about six or seven years old, and <clears throat> she was kept as a slave for many years. She ended up in Italy and uh, was the nanny of a girl who was being educated by the Kenosian sisters. And when she, she went with the little girl uh, to, you know, accompanied her to her catechism. And there she said she found uh, Jesus. I mean, she said she found God that she did not know. Uh, she knew in the bush, but she didn't know his name. Uh, and this, on the back of this booklet, so this is a story of her life, um, and on the, the back here is a picture of her canonization in, in Rome in the year 2000, <clears throat> and for Catholics, you know, that's pretty, pretty uh, important. She was canonized during the Jubilee year 2000, and actually I was there, so, um, so I first met her. Uh, in a spiritual sense, when I was in Sudan, because all these folks that were being persecuted and murdered and enslaved, um, they would they would pray to to Bakita to help them, mm -hmm. and I'd never heard of her before. The kind of ir they, in a sense, irony of her name, but an irony is the wrong word, but beauty of her name, it actually means. Um, fortunate one, and that name was given to her by her people who enslaved her <clears throat> because they kind of mockingly 
acted like she was better off if she, rather than living in her traditional village just to be a slave of these um, these slaveholders. They're, they're a Muslim uh, slaveholder, so that, that's an Arabic name or, or nickname. So like I was telling you, Elizabeth, I, I, I really, my human rights work started uh, you know, in Sudan, and she's a great saint um, that would be prayed to from all of East Africa, and then she's canonized. So, and and in the Catholic Church today, she is uh, the patroness of uh, anti-trafficking. Mm -hmm. So she's uh, she's a great saint. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, well, we do have a couple questions in the Q&A box, so I'll turn to those. Um, and, and again, please feel free to um, post any questions you might have. Uh, the first one is, uh, in your experience with the students in the program, what is the professional output and return for the investment of resources allocated to the program? I'm not quite sure I understand that exactly. Do, do you? Well, I mean, I... I, I invite um, you know the the participant to elaborate, but I take it that it, maybe it's another maybe just to kind of explain in more detail um, what kinds of professional opportunities you know if they invest you know in this degree what kind of professional yeah well co actually there's, yeah. there's a couple of things I should say uh, first <clears throat> so there are scholarships available for. Uh, part of the program, um, their, their merit-based scholarships, but you won't be admitted unless you have merit. So if you are admitted, you will be eligible for scholarships. So that, in terms of, because they mentioned financial output. So in a sense, I just want to make sure people are aware that we have these, these merit scholarships that are available, which defray some, some of the costs, usually about half of the tuition costs, which is already lowered because the university values this program as a, uh, a professional uh, development program. Um, you know, I, I uh, so uh, obviously it's, you don't become a human rights advocate if you want to make money, uh, but, you know, you should be able to live, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, an appropriate life. You shouldn't be in poverty. So the kind of jobs people are getting is, I mean, the program has only been in, in, in existence for, well, this is its fourth year of students. So we've had essentially three classes of five we usually have five or six students. Um, some of the students that I have right now, um, I know that one of the students is gonna work for the World Bank as she has been, uh, she's already kind of an expert in a, in a certain area of human rights. She wants to learn more about the theory and stuff. If she's gonna work for the World Bank, a couple of them are gonna go to law school and a couple of them are still finding out really where their spot is. So in previous classes, as I said, some people, have, some students have gone on to graduate school and they're still in graduate school because they decided to pursue a PhD. Now this is an intent, this is not intended to be a pre-PhD program, but it is appropriate for it. And you know, there are a number of PhD programs that would take, that would take a graduate from one of our programs. Um, as I said, we have um, a student, I'm just thinking through my mind as I go through, I'm working for a uh, Middle Eastern um, advocacy group. We have um, uh, a couple of students who are uh, currently working in the law, a couple who wanna get into religious freedom work. Um, Let's see, we have, um, I have to think back through them, but we have 
students, well, working in NGOs, working at the Bishop's Conference, as I said, we've got a couple of students and they're working in different offices at the Bishop's Conference. We've got one who's working with a new human rights organization founded by a leading a, a really important human rights figure from Latin America. Um, so it's not, it's not a career where you know for sure what it leads to. Like if you graduate from medical school, you're going to be a doctor. This you, you, part of the experience is discerning where you are being led. And there's just a lot of opportunities to get involved. I mean, I have a student now who's thinking about working for the state department. I don't, we'll see if she does. Um, so there's a lot, there's a wide range of things. Um, I mean, if I were going through the program, I mean, I'd be very interested in working on Capitol Hill and one of those committees, but that's not what my students have chosen to do yet, but it could be this year. There will be one. Um, we have another question about, and, and maybe the question is whether the scholarships are also available for international students, but I wonder if in answering that, you might also just say a little bit more about the specific application requirements in general. Um, yes, they are available to international students. Um, international students have to understand, you know, that there's an additional cost. Well, not an additional cost, but there's living expenses and there are tuition expenses. And these scholarships go to tuition expenses. Um, that would be true for a, a U.S. citizen, too. They'd have to find a place to live and they usually live with other graduate students in group houses and seem to, to get by pretty well. Um, what was the other part of that question? So they are available to foreign students. What was the other so, part? So yeah, I just sort of added on to that. If you could say a bit about the, like not just the scholarship, but the application process. Yeah, so if, if you go to that mahumanrights.com, you'll see the specific thing, but basically, you know, we need a transcript. If you're an international student, it has to be verified. And this is not stuff I do. You have to just do it through the graduate admissions office. They have to verify it. And then it has to go through some system that they compare it to uh, whatever universities they are familiar with so that we can uh, accurately evaluate your uh, ability uh, to do the work and suitability for the program. And then uh, there have, you need three uh, letters of recommendation. Uh, the GRE can be waived. Uh, if you've taken the GRE though, you should submit it. Um, I'm trying to remember, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, there's an application you have to fill out. And very importantly, you have to write a statement of purpose. Why is it you wanna do it? Because Again, this isn't the everybody's human rights program. I want to know why it is that you think it's important to learn about it from the Catholic perspective. And there'll also be an interview with me. Uh, if you're a non-English speaking uh, person, you have to take, I think, what's called a TOEFL test to make sure your English is good enough to go through this program, which is all in English. Except I want to mention one thing, Elizabeth, before I forget this. Um, uh, it is all in English, but it gave me a chance to mention Chinese. So none of it's in Chinese, but I want to mention this guy. His name is Chen Guangcheng, who he is from China. He's very famous. Uh, he's called the Barefoot Lawyer. That's the name of his book. And that's a uh, term that was given to barefoot law lawyers and barefoot doctors were people who were kind of unofficial, but they functioned as lawyers and doctors to help uh, the, the poor people in China, particularly rural poor. And he's blind too. You can see he's wearing sunglasses. So he, he helped the, the handicapped and he helped the rural poor and, and he blew the whistle on the abuses of the one child policy, which was forced abortions in China. So they put him in prison. Um, in fact, if you could kind of see this, uh, there's a picture there from the cover of Newsweek magazine. 
where he's called the Bear, Barefoot Warriors. He was on the cover of this Newsweek magazine because he was so famous. There was an international campaign to get him out of prison. Uh, the Dalai Lama and others were, were involved in that. The forward to this book is actually written by the Dalai Lama. And uh, we're, we're honored to have him at Catholic University as a distinguished fellow. And he is in my, uh, I have a Center for Human Rights uh, in which he is part of that center as, my, as well as my master's program. And he teaches uh, several, several classes uh, to the students in the springtime about human rights, about, I mean, if you think about it, think about being in a totalitarian society, being, and then having the additional difficulties of being handicapped, blind, so you couldn't read law. They didn't have braille books in law. So he learned law by having his family read it to him, or he heard it over Voice of uh, Asia part, podcast, and he learned the law. And, uh, and also, I, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but I'll tell you this. There's nobody listening ever to this podcast or this uh, broadcast that will believe how he escaped from China. But it's true. It's a miracle. Um, a blind man escaped from 24-hour surveillance um, by himself. I'll just leave it to you at that. He got to Beijing and he got into the U.S. Embassy. But how he got to Beijing is it's, it's, it is literally unbelievable and literally true. So anyway, we're very honored to have him as part of our program. So our students will, will learn because one of the greatest threats to human rights in the world is totalitarianism and cu coupled with new and effective technologies like facial recognition, which is the way I understand it nowadays. It used to be facial recognition meant a camera would say, oh, it was Bill or Elizabeth leaving that door, you know, two blocks away. Now it's they can tell from your face and your body language whether you had a good meeting or a bad meeting. It's very sophisticated stuff. And China, for instance, has, a, I think, 200 million cameras monitoring uh, people in all the places where they're concerned. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to mention him because he's an important part of our program. And there is no place in the world else where you can study with him or learn from him. Well, you mentioned at the beginning of uh, this session, you know, the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Clearly, the Holy Spirit is at work in his life. And, you know, I hope we'll be with all of our attendees as they discern what they want to do with their own story, as you said. Um, we don't have any more questions in the box. Uh, I, we just have a, a couple more minutes. Um, you know, I want to remind everyone that, you know, this presentation will be available, uh, the recording of it on mahumanrights.com, uh, all the information about the application is located there. Uh, if you do think of questions afterwards, you can write to Mr. Saunders directly at Saunders, which is S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S-W-L, so Saunders W-L, at cua.edu uh, and I, Bill is there any last thing you want to share that I didn't think no you, that was great Elizabeth thank you uh, the only thing I remind people again is the website so if you, you can always go to the website you can find out everything we talked about you can find out for instance about our advisory board you can find out about the curriculum you can uh, you know get in touch with us if you if you do lose the email address or something like that. So it's M A like Master of Arts M A Human Rights dot com, and that'll take you to the page. So we're happy to be in touch with you and answer your further questions you may have. Um, thank you again, Elizabeth, for doing this. Yeah, sure. It was good to be with you. Likewise.